This is the 23rd video in a series about complex analysis. And today we're gonna to use a lot of the results that we've been building up to, to finally use complex analytic methods to evaluate real integrals. And this is a really nice result and a really like famous result. If you look at maybe integrals that are calculated on YouTube, they could often be more easily calculated with complex analytic methods. And so now we'll all know how to do that. Okay, so we're gonna use three main tools. And the first tool is one that we saw in just the previous video, which was the Cauchy residue formula. So it said that the integral over the boundary of a region D of a function f of z dz was equal to two pi i times the sum of all of the residues, where those residues are within the region D. Then our second result is the ML estimate for the value of an integral. It says that the modulus of the integral over a curve C f of dz dz was less than or equal to M times L, where M is an upper bound for the modulus of f on the curve, and the length of the curve is L. So this is sometimes known as the M L estimate. And then finally, we've got this thing that follows fairly easily from the triangle inequality. We haven't used an inequality like this in quite a while, but this will be pretty helpful for a lot of the things that we look at today. And that says that if you take the modulus of the modulus of alpha minus the modulus of beta, you get something less than or equal to the modulus of alpha plus beta. But then that tells you that one over the modulus of the modulus of alpha minus beta is bigger than or equal to one over the modulus of alpha plus beta. That obviously occurs when this kind of thing makes sense. So now that we've got this set up, let's go ahead and jump into some examples. So the first example that we're gonna do, we could do fairly simply with real analytic methods using like the inverse tangent function, but that makes it a nice warm up for using these new results. Okay, so in particular, we're gonna find the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the function one over one plus x squared dx. So what we'll do is instead of looking at the integral from minus infinity to infinity, we will push this into the complex plane. So let's maybe write that. We're gonna consider instead the integral of one over one plus z squared dz. And then it's gonna be over the boundary of some region D. We just have to figure out what region that is. And the region that we'll take is a semicircle in the upper half plane. So generally we'll draw a picture for it. So let's do that. So let's see, there's my complex plane. And I'm gonna draw a semicircle with radius capital R. So that means it has point negative R here, positive R here, and then I R up here. And we'll take our semicircle to be in the upper half plane, but you could do the lower half plane as well. Okay, so let's complete this semicircle so it looks something like that. And then we'll orient this positively. So we'll orient it like this. And we're doing that so that the region D is this thing like inside it. Okay, but maybe one last thing, notice D depends on this radius. So I'll, I'll actually call this D sub R instead of just D. So let's put that here, D sub R. So notice that this breaks up into two pieces. So the first piece is maybe what's happening along this bottom edge. And this bottom edge is in fact the integral from minus R to R of one over one plus X squared DX. That's because over here or down here, I should say the imaginary part is zero and we only have a real part. And then up here, well, that's something that's happening on the semicircle. So this is gonna be the integral of DZ over one plus Z squared um, over, I'll call this CR. This is the semicircle of radius r. Okay, so that means I can calculate this integral two different ways. I can use my formula over here with the residues, and I can also calculate these by hand. So let's maybe start by calculating it with the residues, but we need to find what the singularities are within this region D. 
That's not too bad here because the singularities of one plus z squared or one over one plus z squared are going to be minus i and plus i. So there we've got minus i there and we've got plus i there. And that's because those give us a zero in the denominator of this rational function. Well, i is the only one within dr, so that's the only one we need to worry about. So this is in fact going to be 2 pi i and then the residue of 1 over 1 plus z squared at i. But two videos ago, I think it was video 21, we did lots of examples of just calculating the residue. And if you recall, this is a pole of order 1, so calculating the residue isn't too bad here. We could maybe say that this is 2 pi i and then times the limit as z approaches i of z minus i over z squared plus 1, but I can factor that as z plus i times z minus i. And then we see that this bit cancels, leaving us with a 1 in the numerator. And then if we let z approach i, that becomes 2 times i in the denominator. The 2 times i will cancel this 2 times i, and this gives us pi. Okay, great. So now let's see how we can start putting this together. So we know that pi is equal to the integral over the boundary dr of 1 over z squared plus 1 dz, but that's also equal to the integral from minus r to r of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx plus the integral over cr of, let's see, 1 over 1 plus z squared dz. But now the general rule here is that this extra bit will always go to zero. So that's probably not always the case, but that happens much of the time. So what we'd like to show is as r goes to infinity, this second integral goes to zero, leaving us with the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared equals pi. But we need to show that somehow. And notice we haven't used these last two things that we recalled, so probably we want to do that. Well, let's calculate the modulus of 1 over 1 plus z squared on this semicircle of radius 1. Well, we can use this rule down here. So this is going to be less than or equal to 1 over the modulus of z squared minus 1. I mean, technically those would be within like an absolute value, but we can choose z or r large enough so that it always looks like this. But now along this circle, the modulus of z is always equal to r, so this is equal to 1 over r squared plus 1. And so this thing right here will play the role of our m in this ml estimate. Okay, so that means we have the modulus of the integral over cr of 1 over 1 plus z squared dz is less than or equal to, well, 1 over r squared minus 1 times the length of that curve, but that's a semicircle, so it's going to be the half circle up here of radius r, so that has length pi times r. But now if we take r to infinity, this goes to zero just by standard rules from like a calculus one type class, differential calculus type class, because the degree of the denominator is bigger than the degree of the numerator. Okay, so now putting this all together, if we apply the limit to both sides of this equation, we'll see that we get pi equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx plus nothing because that thing tends towards zero. So there we've done it. We've calculated our first real valued integral using complex analytic methods. All right, let's do a couple more. For our next example, we've got a trigonometric function along with a rational function. So we wanna calculate the integral from minus infinity to infinity, so over the whole real line of sine evaluated at ax over x squared plus 2x plus 5. And this is one that would be quite a bit more difficult to evaluate without complex analytic methods, whereas the previous one we looked at wouldn't be too bad at all. 
And here we're gonna impose the condition that a is a real number bigger than or equal to one. Maybe post in the comments if we need it really to be a real number or if that real number needs to be bigger than or equal to one. But that being said, that's gonna be the condition that we impose just so that we don't have to think about it too hard. So since we're going from minus infinity to infinity, and maybe we could see that the poles from this function only occur at the zeros of this polynomial, which are not real numbers, which we could check pretty easily. Then we can probably use the same contour that we did before. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So I'll redraw it, but it is the same one that we did before. And we'll call it dr again as well. So it'll go from minus r here to r here, and then loop back up through r times i up here. So i times r, and that's not a great circle, but I think that gets the job done. So we have something like that. And then again, we're gonna orient it positively. So we're gonna orient it like this. So this region in here is my d sub r, and the boundary is the boundary of d sub r. So that's our notation here. Okay, so next we'd like to find the poles or the singularities of this function, but like we pointed out, those are gonna occur when the denominator is equal to zero. So we probably need to figure out when that denominator is equal to zero. And I'll change my variable to z because we're gonna push this integral into the complex plane in just a second. So that means I need to solve z squared plus two z plus five equals zero. Luckily enough for us, this thing can be Luckily enough for us, the square can be completed pretty easily. So we can take this five and write it as one plus four. And then we can see that this is z plus one squared plus four equals zero. But that tells us that we have poles, z equals minus one plus two i, and z equals minus one minus two i. Just from moving that four over and then taking the square root. Okay, so where do those occur in our picture? So minus one for a real part, two i for an imaginary part is right here. So that would be this one that I'm circling in purple. And then this minus one minus two i is down here. So I'll circle that one in brown and notice that that's outside of our region dr. So we don't actually need to worry about that when applying our residue formula here. So now that we've got that taken care of, let's take this integral, but we're gonna do another trick. And instead of integrating with the sine ax function or the sine az function, We'll instead use a complex exponential and then push back using Euler's formula at the end. And this has to do with the behavior of the complex exponential versus the behavior of the trigonometric function. It's just a little bit easier to work with. Okay, so now let's calculate this. So we're going to have the integral over the boundary of d, r, of e to the i a z over z squared plus 2z plus 5 dz. Just recalling that e to the i a z is cos a z plus i sine a z. But like we pointed out, we've got poles here and here. The one in purple is the one that we need, so minus 1 plus 2i. So that means here we're going to get the 2 pi i times the residue of this function eiaz over z squared plus 2z plus 5 at minus 1 plus 2i. And that's a simple pole. Each of these are poles of order 1 or simple poles. Now we're going to use the nice trick for calculating the residue at simple poles, which allows us to take the derivative of the denominator and then plug the value in. So again, we used that in previous videos. That should hopefully be pretty familiar. So this is going to give us 2 pi i times e to the i a z over 2z plus 2 evaluated at z equals minus 1 plus 2i. So just to reiterate, we took the derivative of the denominator and now we're going to plug this in. Like I said before, that's something that we went over in a previous video. That leaves us with 2 pi i and then we're going to have, let's see, in the numerator we'll have e to the minus i a, so that's going to be e to the minus i a, 
and then e to the minus 2a, e to the minus 2a. That's because i times i is negative 1. And then in the denominator, so if we double that and add it to 2, the real part cancels and we're left with 4 times i. So we got 4 times i. Okay, so some simplification can happen. So the i and the i can cancel, and this 2 in the numerator cancels the 4 down to a 2. So we're left with something like this. We have pi e to the i a, and then e to the minus 2 a all over 2. That's not the value for our goal integral, that's the value for this thing though. So let's maybe keep that in mind and we'll finish everything else on the next board. So I moved some things around. There's my contour up there again. But what we showed on the last board is the region over the entire boundary of this function was this quantity right here. Now I've named the top portion CR again, and then that bottom portion you can think of as the interval from minus R to R along the real axis. So putting these together get the boundary of the whole thing, just to put some notation in there. So now from here we're going to break this into real and imaginary parts before we start doing our ML estimate. So let's do that. So putting this into real imaginary parts, we have e, or sorry, we have pi over 2 times e to the 2a. So that's what we get from sending this thing downstairs. And then we can expand this e to the minus ia using um, Euler's formula. So that's going to give us what? Cosine of a minus i times sine of a. Now notice our final goal is to find the integral of sine, not the integral of the exponential. So what we'll really want to do in the end is extract the imaginary part of this integral, given that the imaginary part of this integral will be the one involving this sine function. But that allows us to extract the imaginary part of this fairly easily. Okay, so that's good, but we need to figure out what's happening on that upper portion of our contour. Again, we'll assume that that goes to zero, but obviously we have to show it. Um, and that's going to involve these kind of things over here. Okay, so let's get to that. So let's note that on uh, CR, what do we have? We have the modulus of e to the i a z over uh, z squared plus 2z plus 5 will be less than or equal to, so we'll have the modulus of e to the i a z, but I can break that into parts. This is going to be the modulus of e to the minus a y times the modulus of e to the i a x. Great. Just thinking about the fact that z is equal to x plus i y. So z is x plus i y. So kind of distributing those parts out, that's what we get. And then in the denominator, we can split this thing into pieces like we did over here, keeping in mind that the modulus of z is always r because we're on that circle. So that's going to give us something like r squared minus 2r minus 5. So again, using this inequality down here. Now we need to talk about these two things in the numerator. So this thing right here in the numerator is definitely equal to the number 1 because it's e to an imaginary number because we assumed that a was a real number. And then this thing right here is less than 1 given the fact that a is bigger than or equal to 1 and this number y, which is the imaginary part, is positive because we're in the upper half plane. So just to reiterate, this thing is less than or equal to 1. So that means we get this whole thing is less than or equal to 1 over r squared minus 2r minus 5. But as you can see, we've got it home free from here for the integral over cr. So the integral over cr of our function e to the i a z over z squared plus 2z plus 5 dz is bound, or its modulus is bound by, well, m times l. m is this thing. l will be the length of that half circle, which is pi times r again. So we have pi times r over r squared minus 2r 
minus five, but that trends off towards zero as r trends to infinity again. So now let's maybe see if we could put this all together real quick. So in the end, we have the integral from minus infinity to infinity of sine ax over x squared plus 2x plus 5 dx is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of the imaginary part of the integral over the boundary of dr of e to the i a z over z squared plus 2z plus 5 dz. Okay, so let's talk through how we got rid of some of this stuff. So the sine was able to be replaced with the exponential because we're taking this imaginary part. And the imaginary part of this exponential is exactly the sine. So that's good. And then we were able to get rid of this CR term right here, or really add it in because it tends to zero as R tends to infinity. Okay, so now we can evaluate this integral like we did right here and take the imaginary part. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with minus pi times sine of a over 2e to the 2a. So that's our final value for this integral. Okay, let's do another. So our next example is going to be a little bit different. We don't have an improper integral like we did before. Now we're going to find the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta over 3 plus cosine theta. So I think you can do this with the so-called Weierstrass um, substitution, but you can also do it with complex analysis. So let's see maybe how that would go. So we're going to notice that this looks an awfully lot like we're doing the integral over some sort of unit circle because we've got like a cosine z or a cosine theta here and we're running from 0 to 2 pi. So maybe we should parametrize the unit circle. So let's do that. So let's take the modulus of z equal to 1 and parametrize the unit circle by e to the i theta. Oh, and I guess I should say we're taking theta from 0 to 2 pi. That'll build the entire circle. So if z is e to the i theta, then that makes dz equal to i e to the i theta d theta, just by calculating differentials. Furthermore, we know that cosine of theta is equal to 1 half e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta just by inverting Euler's formula. But in terms of z, that's going to be 1 half z plus 1 over z. And now we almost are ready for a substitution. This guy right here needs to be inverted a little bit, but we can do that without much problem. Notice this means that d theta is equal to one over i times one over e to the i theta, but that's one over z, given that e to the i theta is z. And now between this d theta term right here, which is in terms of z, and this cosine theta term here, which is in terms of z, we can substitute this entire integral for something in terms of z. So now this is going to be the integral over the unit circle, so I can notate that as the modulus of z equals 1, and then I'll be left with 1 over 3 plus 1 half z plus 1 over z, and then I need my d theta term, so that's going to give me a 1 over i. I'll bring that out front, and then I'll have a 1 over z dz. So that's putting everything in there. Next up, maybe I'll take this 1 half, multiply the numerator and the denominator by 2 in order to cancel that. So if I do that, the 1 half is gone, but I get a 2, which I can put in the numerator, and then 3 times 2 is 6. And then I'll take this z and distribute it through to all of these terms. That'll leave me with 2 over i times the integral over the unit circle. So the modulus of z equals 1 of, let's see what we have. We have z times z, which is z squared in the denominator. We have z times 6, which is 6z in the denominator. And then we have z times 1 over z, which is 1 in the denominator. So now we're integrating this. So now we've got a rational function. We can find the poles of a rational function pretty easily. We just need to find the poles which lie within the region where the modulus of z equals 1.
So let's maybe see if we can do that. That's going to be where z squared plus 6z plus 1 equals 0. Again, this is one that you can probably complete the square pretty easily. This is going to be z squared plus 6z plus 9 equals, let's see, what do we get? 8. So that's after we kind of add enough to complete the square. So I added 8 to this side, and I added 8 to that side. So that gives me um, z plus 3 quantity squared equals 8. And then I have negative 3 plus or minus... Let's see, the square root of 8, which is 2 times the square root of 2. So there I've got my two poles. They both live along the negative real axis. Now we just have to figure out where they live along the negative real axis in relation to our unit circle. So let's maybe get a picture of the unit circle here. So there's our unit circle. And in fact, one of them is going to be just inside the unit circle, and one, is, one of them is just outside the unit circle. So this one just inside the unit circle is minus 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2. But that means we can calculate this integral via the residue theorem pretty easily, just by looking at this residue right here. So that's going to give us 2 over i, and then we'll have um, tot and then times 2 pi i, the residue of our function, which is now 1 over z squared plus 6z plus 1, at negative 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2. So we can use that same trick that we did before, where we take the derivative and plug uh, this point in, and that's going to leave us with 4 times pi. Notice the i's cancel. And then we'll have 1 over 2z plus 6 evaluated at negative 3 plus 2 times the square root of 2. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. This negative 3 will multiply to the 2 and cancel with the 6. So that's cool. And then we'll have 2 times 2 times the square root of 2. That'll be 4 times the square root of 2. That'll cancel this 4. And we'll left, be left with pi over the square root of 2. But then notice here, we didn't have to do anything funny. We did a direct substitution of our real integral to a complex integral. So this value that we get for the complex integral in the end is in fact the value of our real integral. Okay, I think we've got one more example. So here we've got a little bit different of a problem. So we've got the integral from 0 to infinity of the square root of x over x squared plus 5x plus 6. And what's interesting about this one is this square root of x has non-isolated singularities depending on when we take the branch cut. I should say maybe the square root of z has non-isolated singularities depending on where we take the branch cut. So let's first say which function we're going to consider integrating. So we're going to consider integrating um, the square root of z over z squared plus 5z plus 6 dz. And then over here, let's make our discussion about exactly which value of the square root of z we take. So let's take the square root of z um, with a branch cut along the positive real axis. So along the zero to infinity. So that tells us it's gonna be analytic on C minus this zero to infinity, which means when we set up our integral, we have to miss that somehow. And I should say when we set up the integral for the complex integral, we have to miss that somehow. So here's the typical way to do it. And this is something called a keyhole contour, which I think is like really nice and aesthetic. There we've got our complex plane set up and we're gonna go out here, our units. We'll go back here, our units. We'll go up here, our units. So that's I times R and we'll go down here, our units. So that's minus I times R. And we're gonna put almost an entire circle here. So let's draw almost an entire circle, but they do not meet at the positive real axis. Then we'll sneak back to the origin along each of these, and then also create a bubble around the origin. We need to create a bubble around the origin because this thing is not analytic at the origin either. So let's create this bubble around the origin, and this bubble around the origin has a radius of epsilon. 
so that goes epsilon away from the origin so like this point back here is the point minus epsilon this point right here is i epsilon this point down here is minus i epsilon and then so on and so forth now we're gonna like orient this so that the stuff on the inside is positively oriented so that means we need it to be counterclockwise around the outside so like this then it's going to go back in this direction around this way then back that way and then that'll be it okay nice so that's the region that we're going to call dr in this case so dr is everything in the middle of this so there's our dr so let's put over here that we're taking the integral over the boundary of dr. So let's first take this integral using the residue theorem, which means we need to find the poles here. That's not too bad because this is a polynomial that factors. We have z squared plus 5z plus 6 equals z plus 3 times z plus 2, which means we have simple poles at z equals negative 3 and z equals negative two. Simple poles are the easiest ones to work with, obviously. So this will be equal to two pi i plus our residues. But these are both simple poles, so we can use our simple pole formula where we take the derivative of the denominator. That's going to give us the square root of z over 2z plus 5 evaluated at z equals negative 3 and then the square root of z over 2z plus 5 evaluated at z equals negative 2. Again, we're using this formula for residue at simple poles. Okay, so let's see what that leaves us with. That leaves us with 2 pi i. We have the square root of negative 3. That's going to be i times the square root of 3. Then in the denominator, we have negative 3 times 2 plus 5. That's going to be negative 1. And then up here, we have the square root of negative 2. So that's going to be i times negative 2. And then in the denominator, we have 2 times 2. That's 4, but it's negative plus 5, which is 1. So we're left with something like that. But now let's notice that this i will now come through and turn this i into a minus 1, which will cancel here. Turn this i to a minus 1, which will change that plus to a minus, leaving us with something like 2 times pi times the square root of 3 minus the square root of 2. So let's maybe sneak that in right here. That is the value of this integral over the boundary of dr. That's 2 pi i root 3 minus root 2. Now let's get rid of this and then we'll evaluate this integral by looking at all of the pieces. We just finished showing that this integral was equal to 2 pi square root of 3 minus square root of 2. Now we're ready to break this into pieces. So this is going to break into the integral over cr and then minus the integral over c epsilon. I'll use this shorthand here. And so it's minus the integral over c epsilon because this is oriented the other way. And then we've got the integral of these two things that's ha that are happening on either side of the real axis. So let's do this top one first. So that'll be plus the integral from epsilon to r of this function right here, dx. Now there is like a trivial imaginary part, which is i times epsilon, but kind of thinking ahead, we're going to push epsilon to zero, so we don't really need to worry about that so much. You could include it in, but as you'll see, it doesn't do anything. So I'll just write this as the square root of x over x squared plus 5x plus 6 dx. So something like that. And then we've got the one that's happening along the bottom too. Notice that is oriented the other way, so it needs a minus sign. So that'll be minus epsilon to r of something dx. This is a little bit trickier though, because on this region down here, since we've gone all the way around the circle, our value of x will be multiplied by e to the i 2 pi x. And that's going to give us some sort of phase factor when we compose it into this square root function. So notice e to the i 2 pi x is just equal to x, but inside the square root function, because of the multi-valuedness, you get something different. So this is like going way back to the beginning of the course. So that means in the numerator, we have e to the i pi times the square root of x because the square root like halves that 2 pi that's in the exponent. 
And then in the denominator, nothing changes because these are all like integral powers, which are single value functions. So we have x squared plus 5x plus 6. But let's see what we've got here. This e to the i pi is famously equal to negative 1. That cancels that to a plus. But then if that cancels that to a plus, I can add these together and get 2. So maybe I'll do that. I'll put a 2 here, and then I'll erase this one. So in the end, we're going to take a limit as epsilon goes to 0 and r goes to infinity. And that will change this thing right here into our kind of goal integral. That means we just need to take care of the CR part and the C epsilon part. And we can do that using our estimates over here. So let's do this CR one first. So the modulus of the integral over CR of, maybe I'll just call this thing f of z, given that this is the last example and we haven't named a function yet, so this is f of z. So this is going to be less than or equal to 2 pi r times the square root of r over r squared minus 5r minus 6. So let's see, this 2 pi times r is the length of the way around the entire circle. That's given that we've got a whole circle there. That's the circumference of the circle. The square root of r comes the, from the square root of z. The r squared minus 5r minus 6 comes from applying this reverse triangle inequality thing to the denominator. But notice that as r goes to infinity, this thing goes to zero, and that's because the degree of the denominator is larger than the degree of the numerator. Now we can do something similar on c epsilon. So the modulus of the integral on c epsilon of f of z dz will be less than or equal to, well, we get essentially the same thing, just with epsilons instead of r's. So we have 2 pi epsilon square root of epsilon over epsilon squared minus 5 epsilon minus 6. Now, as epsilon goes to 0, this thing still goes to 0. So let's write that down. This goes to 0 as epsilon goes to 0. And that's because the numerator approaches 0 while the denominator does not approach 0. So in the end, we have this integral right here is approaching 0, and this integral right here is approaching 0. But as we let r tend to infinity, so r tends to infinity, epsilon tends to 0, this guy tends to 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of our goal, which is the square root of x over x squared plus 5x plus 6 dx. Okay, so the organization has gotten a little away from us, but let's see what we have. We have 2 times root 3 minus root 2 is equal to this integral right here. This integral right here was equal to two things that tended to 0 as r tended to infinity and epsilon tended to 0 plus another integral that tended to 2 times our goal as r tended to infinity and epsilon tended to 0. So that means that in the end, we have this object right here is equal to this object right here, which means we can easily divide both sides by 2, and we have a value for our goal integral, which is pi times the square root of 3 minus the square root of 2. Okay, good. So now let's get rid of this and I'll leave you with a couple of warm-ups. So here I've got four nice warm-up problems. So the first is to find the integral from minus infinity to infinity of dx over x squared plus a squared all squared. Next, let's put a trig function in there. So the integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine 4x over x squared plus 1 all squared. Next, we've got a trigonometric integral, so the integral from minus pi to pi of d theta over 1 plus sine squared theta. And finally, something involving a radical. So just be careful about the phase factor here. It's going to be a little bit different than we saw in the previous uh, example. We've got the integral from 0 to infinity of the cube root of x over x squared plus 7x plus 12. And that's a good place to stop.